Okay. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple. Some of you may remember him from the, from the City of Ark, some from the Celestial Realms with the Book of Graces. Now he's back with a, with a quarterly magazine known as the Arklander, for, well, Arklands. The man best known as Good Brother Nick. How you doing today, man? I'm very well. Thank you for the uh, introduction. Every time I come on here, it's like I have my own sort of uh, medieval herald, the way the kings used to, who would kind of an announce uh, a, 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 announce you to the kind of the royal court with a, a whole whole list of kind of titles and, and wondrous achievements. So it's 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 great to be back. Um, and yes, we we've um, uh, kickstarted the the Arklander which is our quarterly scene um and that's there to really take all the things that we've put in the or all the things we couldn't get in the spellforge's companion and the book of the graces and to really kind of build those out and develop them and and bring in new stuff new um classes and um origins which is our you know we drop the word race and reuse the word origin um and um new aspect new elements to spell forging mm -hmm. and we want we one of the things that's always kind of frustrating and you don't realize this until you've actually written and published a book is that um you have more ideas than you can get into like a 160 to 180 pages always and there's always somebody in your team who kind of chops off something really brilliant that you've come up with um but the trick is really and you know if anyone's out there who's planning to create some of the, like, the things that we've created that never chuck anything away keep um keep it keep a pile of of it because there'll always be an opportunity later on to say, now we told you a bit about that, but here's some more. Um, and so that, that, I guess that's that's kind of what the Arkland is there there to be. It's sort of here's here's some more here's some more um, things that about our world which you can easily take and adapt into into gameplay. And, and that's kind of the plan, really. Mm -hmm. Um. The, the, the plan, as I was saying before we started recording, the plan's been slightly derailed by the fact that I got coronavirus at the uh, the most inconvenient time, which isn't to suggest that there's a good time to have coronavirus. But uh, after about day two of the the kind of the launch process and, and Kickstarter launches are pretty active things. You know, it's, it's a month long mental workout. You've got to really kind of bust your ass to... Um, um to, to hit your targets and all that kind of stuff well we we we, we hit our targets on the first day because it was only only a little launch but we've kind of been a little bit stuck ever since because it's, you know I've, I've just not had the energy to um uh to, to work as hard as i normally would do on it so it, uh but such is life you know such is life mm -hmm. and <sighs> Would it be fair of me to say that a lot of a lot of what 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 you're planning on putting into the Arklander zine is going to be things that were that were pla that were planned for either um, Spellforger's Companion or Book of Graces, but for one reason or another, weren't it, you weren't able to fit them in? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, take for example, we've create we, we're looking at. Um, creating an entirely new um, uh, character class because what we have is we have four base classes and three caster add-ons mm -hmm. now in our um, forthcoming Kickstarter that's coming in September the book of the phantasm we're adding an, a new caster add-on um, the mirror mage which I'll talk a bit more about later on mm -hmm. but we, we're gonna throw in in the Artlander a new character origin called the scald and this is um not really something that's similar to a, to a bard it, it's a, a, a way of using magic through telling stories 
And in order to do that, you have to create an entirely power, you know, an entirely original um, system that kind of runs alongside, kind of contrasts with, and yet complements spell forging. And um, there's, there was no way we could have got that into the Spellforge's companion. Partly because people would have gone, okay, got, got my head around Spellforging. Oh my God, what's this? And you, you, you don't really want people saying that when they're reading through the book you've given, you've, you've created for them. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I guess one of the lessons I think I've learned through world building and publishing is sort of, everything in its right place at its right time don't kind of rush through concepts um do things gradually bit by bit yeah, um, yeah. And, and i think the the art lander hopefully is going to be a good way of doing that um or one of the things i often i always my kind of model for kind of things done very successfully is how uh, the art marvel mcu how they've staggered the concepts they've introduced uh, and now it's obviously, you know, in phase four of Marvel, it's, you know, terrifically kind of diverse and complex and all sorts of things going on. But originally, they just established the the Avengers. Um, and then they established weird things like Doctor Strange, that there was like a magically bit to the world. And then with Guardians of the Galaxy, they established that there was a cosmic bit, bit to the world. But they were smart enough to not throw everything into the mix right away and and be very very you know very very gradual and i guess the, the reason why you, you do that is because you're in a relationship with the the audience even if you're just writing a zine you're in a relationship with your audience and they are they come to what you do they know about D and they know about dice and stuff like that but they they, they, they come to what you do um without any frame of reference about who you are and what you're doing. And so you've got to be very, very gentle and very careful to lead them through what you're all about and what you offer and what the world looks like stage by stage. But a massive, great kind of concept dump ain't going to make anybody uh, any the wiser or any the happier, I don't think. Um, though no doubt there are people who would beg to differ, but, you know, there you go. Mm-hmm. And... I think now when it can, now I th- I think with the five realms that you that is discussed when it comes to the Arclander, mm-hmm. two of them we've ar- we've already cut co- we've already covered with the mortal realm and the ce- and the celestial realm. Yeah. Um, but the other three I don't th- I don't think we've had we've um, delved too much into. So I'd like no, no. to I'd like to amend that if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Okay. And- so so yes, you go on. Um, I'll start. We'll start with the red waste. Okay. So I like to make sure that there is at least somewhere in the realities that I create that is slightly on the verge of being unknowable. So what the, the what the red waste looks like is it's a, a vast kind of red desert. It sort of probably looks a bit like. Um, the, the, the place where they find Harrison Ford in Blade Runner 2049. It's um, a vast red desert with a, a sort of like a, a toxic yellow sky. And littered across this desert are um, the the kind of the, the corpses of great kind of behemoths that have fought epic and slightly uh, and, and unknown battles in the past. And so the, the, the red waste, when people encounter it, that they, they surmise that they've, they're stepping onto some kind of gigantic celestial battlefield. Um, and the red waste itself is a kind of a conduit between worlds. It's a, it's a dimension in its own right. But often if you want to get to somewhere else, because there are more than five dimensions, but again, you know, we're, we're not going there yet. You have to cross through the, um, the red waste. Mm-hmm. And the red waste is... Um, partly the product of the many wars that the the keeper fought long long ago. And now, for for those that aren't au fait with our plans, um, the keeper is the the one god of the universe 
who um, didn't create the universe, contrary to popular belief. He discovered this uh, primordial chaos and shaped it into a celestial realm and damnation, which we'll talk about in a bit. And then great later on, during the Devourer War, he created the mortal realm. Um, and the, um, the, there are a, a number of competing theories about what the Red Waste is. Firstly, the, it... it the, the, some people imagine it is this place where the, you know, this, this, this kind of wilderness that was the product of, of creation. You know, you create a heaven, you create a hell. And then there's this other bit that um, you, you, you dump all the waste products into. Some people in the Arcverse believe that it, it is a, a, a corridor between worlds. And other people believe it is this uh, battle world, this battlefield. Um, where the, uh, the the many enemies of the keeper, because the, the keeper is a kind of like a monotheistic one god, is a proper jerk as well. Um, he's, there's very little benign about him. He's um, real kind of uh, angry sort of prima donna. and has many many enemies. Um, that 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 that's where they they kind of they fought their battles against them. The, the red waste source is this funny sort of place because there are there are tides of energy that that ripple through the multiverse, um, and they wash things just as sort of a, a, a branch or a, a bottle might be washed to the shore um, in, in our world. The red waste is a place where think lost things get sort of they kind of turn up. And it's quite common, for example magical items in the arcverse to to vanish you know magical items sort of never really belong to anybody they have a little spark of spark of magical energy which is really originates from the keeper himself embedded within them and they can be sort of washed away on these tides of energy which would materialize very annoyingly but if you're in a dungeon and uh, a host of nasty, hideous creatures are attacking you, and you know you've got an invisibility ring. You reach for it, and then, unfortunately, and we're sort of writing the mechanic on this one, it's not there. Um, uh, and that sounds pretty bad, I know, but and it probably wouldn't happen to a medium power item like a magic, like a, a magical ring. But if you if you're packing something really powerful, and the GM wants to power the game down slightly, things can always be rippled off to the uh, the red waste yeah. and this sort of just the, 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 these tides of energy just dematerialize things so the, the the red waste it sounds like a dead place but it's actually not as well there are all sorts of wonders there are, there are uh, an orig a race of origin of um, uh, creatures called the nurakai who look rather like kind of bane from batman they have face masks that help them to breathe in the red waste and um crossover and they are heavily armed and you know um and they they tend to do work like bounty hunting and um treasure seeking and you know, great traders and sometimes will turn up in the mortal realm and they seem very mysterious um and are great in a bar fight really well they sort of this, this they're about six foot five or more bang somebody's head off a table if they look at them the wrong way so they, they, we're hoping at some point they're going to be one of the core character origins for when we we do the book of the red waste mm -hmm. which is going to have to find a slightly catchier title than the book of the red waste that doesn't scan really so so that's that's the red waste um for and so but we'll be probably kickstarting something on that is that's going to be one of our, our later projects because so, the the next one we're doing is the book of the phantasm then it's going to be the book of the fade and it's going to be the book of the dam of damnation mm -hmm. and finally uh, probably about 2026 20, or something we'll do gray kingdom and the red waste mm -hmm. and and within within each within each of them i'm get i'm guessing that i'm guessing that in both the short term and long term, there will be little additions to spe to um, to the sandbox that is spell forging. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, we're going to be doing a lot of that in the Arclander as well, because the the thing about again, frustratingly, with the spell companion, something like spell forging, it all. I mean, 
it almost needs just a, a singular volume on its own. The Spell Forger's Companion can has like you know classes and origins and world law and all this sort of stuff in it. It's sort of like a, a general purpose um, core rule book. But there's so much we could say about spell forging, about the idea, you know, not all of the forges are, are working very well at the moment. There's an, an, an evil malign presence that's creating fallen forges. Um, the forges work slightly differently in different dimensions. Um, and there are now, we're going to create, you know, new uh, caster uh, classes that kind of interact with forges in, in slightly different ways. Um, and so, you know, by the time we get to uh, Arclands 2.0, which probably, again, about 2026, 20, 27, we'll, we'll do a, a 2.0, um, for spell forging will be really quite, quite radically, not different, but expanded. Um, uh, because, you know, it's, there's, there's such a, a, a ton or a scope for such a ton of stuff that. And the really cool thing is now the more Arclanders we get on board, the more people, you know, write to us and go, oh, I've done this kind of spell. And could it do this? Could it do that? And when you look at the rules, there are all sorts of in interesting kind of explorations about what, if you read the rules precisely, what a spell actually can do. We had a guy who um, said, ah, I've, I've broken your system. Um, I've created a, 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 an armor shred spell, so you can go into a, um, uh, a, a combat round, use your your your, your spell casting to shred someone's armor, and so like, yes, you can do that. And, this, uh, and, it goes, and so he said, well, that means that I can defeat anybody, but I can take all their armor away. And I said, well, yes, you can. But look at the duration of the spell. Is that, oh, right. So, you know, the, the, the power, the efficacy of the spell, the power of the spell is kind of limited because when the duration ends, the armor instantly repairs itself. And so you get a period where you have an advantage in a battle, but you uh, you better make the most of that. Um, so that's just a kind of an, an example of how, of how, you know, the spell forging allows the player to have all this, this creativity, but it's kind of tempered by, obviously, parameters and, and by the, the, the GM saying, ah, yeah, but. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, since we, hint, since, since we hinted at it earlier, let's talk, let's talk about the Mirror Mage. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be so cool. So cool. Right. Okay, so in the book The Phantasm, right, um, the, the phantasm is this parallel reality that exists alongside the mortal realm, and um, the entity the, the that rules the phantasm, this character called Onikaius, um, in a bit to defeat his enemies, accidentally created this thing called the mirror world, and uh, that which is part of the phantasm. Um, and not much is known about the mirror world. That one of the the gods of the of the phantasm got sucked into it, uh, um, and exists as some kind of malign presence on the other side. But what the mirror world did was started to to fragment. So bits of this kind of magical mirror substance started to drift throughout um, a variety of different realities. And certain individuals who have the power of fate can see it. So you're you're there. Uh, um, you know, mind your own business and some sort of flat kind of almost sort of two-dimensional piece of glass in the air seems to float past. And nobody else can see it, but you can. And you can pluck it out of the air uh, and use it. Um, and use it in, in a variety of different ways. So what, what we did was we said, right, there's a character here um, that will have some limited spell forging ability. Mm -hmm. Um but that will be that will be kind of compensated by having them having um, instead of spell spell forging and then spell casting a host of a kind of core abilities themselves where they can manipulate um, and make weapons and other items from uh, mirror glass um, that they can see and no one else can and use uh, higher levels uh, limited uh, you know a, a uh, an ability to scry to see you know if, if see through mirrors that are dotted actual real world mirrors that are that, that are dotted uh, within their kind of range of power um and to perform mirror like illusions to create a, for example a, a double of themselves and so 
the, the challenge with that was to um, live to, to to limit down the the amount of spell forging that can be done without taking spell forging away from the character completely because uh, the the game still does sort of really focus sort of center around spell forging. Um, but without, you know, then making the character super uber powerful um, through um, through the through kind of mirror mirror magic, and but the, the combination of two, I think, is, is going to create something pretty exciting, pretty fun for people. Um, and it's just about thinking about what different ways can you, what different sort of kind of like niche ways can you take spell casting characters. Uh, and with all Arclan's characters, there is there there's a, a kind of a, a subtle interplay between um, a martial, you know, the the base martial class and and the spell the the, the spellcaster add-on. So so that's what's coming, and that's going to be in the book of the Phantasm, which will be kickstarting uh, hopefully September October time. Mm -hmm. Now, one. Now, when it came to the mini campaign that you that um that you're plan that you're planning on putting in the Arklander, what's obviously I'm not going to ask um the full details on the, on that on that on that, on that mini campaign, but what sort what sort of tone and what sort of um what sort of adventuring style is it going for? Since there's a lot of directions one can go with a campaign. Um, it, it it's. It's going to be a, a key part of the Arkland story. So um, it's it's set in a part, a very troubled part of the uh, the mortal realm, uh, Aestis, the continent in the mortal realm, called the Milllands, um, which is facing the threat of invasion from Scaris. And Scaris is a kind of a um, a cross between kind of Puritan England and North Korea, you know, if if, if you can imagine anything more unpleasant than those two things. Um, and there, there is some. Uh, whilst this this is is happening, the the, the characters are first initially are on a spy hunt. They've got to track down the uh, uh, the people undermining the Milllands. Uh, and then they've got to face the, the threat of a full-scale invasion from Scaris. Um, and then they'll, they'll be gradually, uh, quarterly, a, 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 a bit more of the adventure, um, which we, I, I won't spoiler alert here. But there's going to be some overlap with the Phantasm. Uh, so the, that kind of, the, the Phantasm intrudes into, the, into our reality, uh, which begins to kind of complicate things slightly more. And we're going to throw in there one of my favourite planned character origins for a long time, which, is, which are the Rivik. And the Rivik were there in the Spellforger's Companion as a character, uh, as, not as a character origin, but uh, as a creature. But you get to play them, and they are sort of like three foot tall talking rats, basically. Um, and if, if anyone has ever read C.S. Lewis's uh, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, that's where we went with it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're sort of, they're, they're great on ships, our, our Rivik, and we, because we've got, we have a, a sort of like a pirate character, the Corsair, they're sort of pretty much made to, 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 to be Corsairs or Marauders. And you know they they they're the sorts of people. There's people in the Arklands that and in uh, aren't really used to um, small furry talking animals, particularly they like a kind of a nice orderly world where these things don't happen. And then in your tavern, these characters walk in and they drink a lot and they use quite bad language. Um, then they like to gamble um, and throw darts and um, at a certain point in the evening they'll probably have a fight um, and we're going to give people the the excitement and joy of playing a, a sort of like a, a rather obnoxious drunken talking rat and if that's not what most people get into role play games for I, I then I don't know what is what 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 humanity is about anymore I really don't you know and as far as far as how as far as how out there a a, a drunken talking rat is, um, 
I just, the only reason I can't say that's out there is because I've suffered through some of the latter wizardry games. Okay. Which had, which had, a, which had, for all intents and purposes, a rat mafia. Rat mafia. Yeah. Well, that's I. I. I would be very keen to replicate a rat mafia <laughs> in, in, in the in the Arklands. Um. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to that. That's going to be a a lot of fun. Um. Yeah, so so that's that's coming up in in terms of the campaign, and the other character origin that we're going to do is the um, the scabak. Um, in the scabaks were were kind of monsters really from the Spellforger's companion, and I I drew kind of inspiration for the scabak from the Cylons in Battlestar Galactica. I always thought in the the rebooted Battlestar Galactica there was something just really really fascinating about there being simply 12, 12 types of Cylon, I think, which in the show you only see nine, I think. I can't remember. Um, oh, yes, because they're the, the hidden ones. By the way, if no one's ever watched it, I'm not going to spoil it anymore. Um, and so you, you, I created these things which come from Damnation called the Scabag. Um, and they are very, they, they are essentially assassins. Um, you hire them to do certain jobs. And they're, they're actually, what they actually look like is sort of rather more like a, kind of like a Tolkien orc. Um, you know, the sort of rather really kind of um, hideous sort of creature. But there are uh, seven different types, so d different human, human archetypes of um the scabak um so they always appear as as uh, you know in, in human terms they, they always appear looking as uh, uh, looking like seven particular sorts of person uh, identical um and so they're, they're they're pretty acrobatic and they're good at fighting with the staff and um uh they are this you know trying to step away from these kind of conventional ideas of, of, of good and evil. Um, they are, you know, your, 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 your standard mercenaries and they can wind up doing things which are ostensibly good or ostensibly evil, depending on who pays them to do what. Um, but I, th I thought that's an interesting idea in, in itself, as a thing that comes from damnation, which is what most Arklanders would view as being a kind of, as, as well, essentially hell, um, they they come from damnation, but behave in, in remarkably standard sorts of ways in in terms of kind of human morality or Im immorality. Um, they they can be hired to do things, and will probably do it if you pay them what they're asking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and of course, of course, of course, some. Um... I'd imagine the bet. I'd imagine the best way to get their attention is to outbit is to uh, is to um, be the person who's willing to big provide a bigger paycheck. <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally, totally. Yes. So they work basically like human beings do. You know, <laughs> um, they um, uh, the, the, they are, they're often because because I think the thing is when we talk about kind of. Um, money and financial, you know, uh, financial remuneration in terms of fantasy roleplay games. We always imagine it from a kind of like a human centric point of view, uh, which is difficult to imagine it from any other perspective. So, um, you know, you or I or any other human being we know tends to be motivated by certain things of which money is one. Um, because it will, money is this thing that we know when we have it will uh, answer our problems or so we'll solve our problems and acquire its goods and services and all, all that kind of thing. But if if you have basically, I mean, what the story of the Scabak is that they're wh wherever they're from, the forces of damnation kind of caught them and dragged them and forced them to to live in damnation for a long, long time and serve the lords of damnation, and they've. Uh, they're now, uh, after the Sundering, kind of uh, coming out into the mortal realm and, you know, seeing what it's all about. And so they might, it, it might be that, you know, they, they require a certain amount of payment in uh, gold in, in, in the mortal realm to give them the things they need. 
but they're motivated by acquiring other sorts of things. Perhaps they want to get back home to their, their home world or dimension, wherever that is. Or maybe they need things to establish themselves in damnation, which they've decided they rather like. Or, who knows? We'll we'll drop. We'll, we'll get over that conceptual bridge when we, when we come to it. But mm-hmm. I think with these sorts of things, it all starts with that question. You know, with with this thing I've created, what what motivates it to do anything at all? Um, and often acquiring the, this sort of soft, precious metal called gold doesn't really explain motivation at all. But then again, you know, small the dragon, he, he liked gold, didn't he? Oh, yeah, no. I remember, oh, oh, the, I remember one particular entry tr- um, trying to trying to go trying to go into why dragons would collect the hordes that they would. Um, there's been a couple. There's been a couple of takes. One, one of them was was because of how malleable gold is and being able to withstand um, breath. The other is it's the other was it's less about the gold and more about it having a power source called called Ka. Um, that that was in Fireborn, which is a deep cut. Which is a deep hidden cut of um of F- of Fantasy Flight Games' early attempts at role-playing games but give but given that given that um when you in the in that list of bullet points regarding the arclander <clears throat> um you mentioned the you mentioned that it gives the core spell forging rules. I I hope it's not a case where each issue would repeat the co- the core rules each time, or is it just no no? Skinny? Well, what what we're going to do for for all subscribers to begin with is to is to create a kind of like um, a a chopped down version of the the core rules to to accompany in a sort of like a slightly separate download. Uh, just because you know it, it would be pretty gutting if so if people came along and said, "Oh, well, uh, that sounds good, yeah, fantastic," and then they look at it and they've never heard of Arclans before and they can't make head and tail of it and they don't understand. No one's told them about spell forging, so we, we're going to solve that problem by just giving a, um, a an additional sort of supplementary guide that uh, you know uh, that, that goes with it, which is a will be a a segment from the the, the spell forger's companion but yeah they reiterating that in every it'll become a right drag wouldn't it um and uh, there's only there's only so much uh, space and time and bandwidth we've got so we want to focus that on exciting fun stuff um and probably what we'll do is in every in every edition we'll put a link to something on drive through where you know if you haven't got all this stuff and you want the free version click here away you go done deal um so that that will solve that problem um but yeah i know you can't you can't go rehashing all that all the time um so yes so there you go yeah yeah i mean well you well you could certain shows always get always have this always have that same there was that there was that cliche with cartoons that, as i was growing up where they would where they would give that same summary the in the first few minutes Oh, yeah. Every, every time. Yeah. I don't advise Previously. it, but people can do it. <laughs> no, no. I think people get very bored of that, you know, and rightly so. Because um, what we, we, we're trying to do is sort of, it's a kind of complicated thing. We're, we're trying to tell a big and complex story about the universe we've created. And by doing so, uh, you know, take people forward onto the, the, the next thing we're writing. Uh, but the story does have a, a kind of a gradual sort of denouement where, where we're going to take people to. And instead of reading it, as you would do in a, a novel, they're going to play that eventually. Um, so, so yeah, we don't want to go clogging it up by just rehashing and reiterating and repeating endlessly this that, and the other. That would be very, very tedious. Um, yeah. Um, so, so that's that. That's that. Yeah. 
Speaking of that, when it comes to lore, have you have you given consideration to writing some parts of the lore articles in an in-universe style? Um, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Um, there's a uh, on our world anvil. I've, I've written a little bit in the style of there's a kind of a rather irritating old sage who's now long dead called Morday Mohanan who uh, was a, had opinions on everything and was maybe not right about absolutely everything. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it, it kind of like a, mo a, a more insufferable um, sort of uh, Gandalf type without the magic. Uh, and more day, more Hannon. Sometimes I'll refer back to him um, and sometimes I even read bits of prose in, in the style of, of him. Um, I think for basically as we're, we're setting the world out that's the kind of a more of a job for later um adding more of that more of that kind of in in world style prose and and um and writing mm -hmm. um and um, then hold on uh, Uh, now, with that in, with that in mind, um, what do you see the what do you see the um, page count for for each for issues of um, of the Arclander to be? I I know that that's not something that you can be that can be consistent, but is there like a yeah. like a cap oh. where you're gonna say no more pages? Well, um, we we look because we're doing digital only. At the moment, anyway, you know, you don't know how these things go. We're doing digital only. We've we've got the luxury of of writing, of writing as long as we as we wish, yeah. but you you have the the problem of um, if you do that of people having back to zine or hopefully pay for the zine later on and then getting this sort of. Uh, vast, vast new resource, and actually, if people back a zine, they want a zine. This is some, sounds like intuitive, but mm -hmm. country, but it's, it's pretty obvious. Um, if people want something that is, um, you know, sixty pages, often if you provide them with two hundred pages, it's it's more than they have the, the the time or the willingness or the want to to consume. And so, so it makes sense, really, to, I mean, our our core books uh, and expansion books about 160 pages. So I would probably place the Arclander at being about half that. Um, and, and, and people can kind of can consume it on, on, on that basis. You know, if you were, I got a train yesterday, bought a magazine in the station because I knew kind of about how long I had on the train and about how much I wanted to consume. You know, I didn't go and buy, you know, a, a, a 600 page book. Um, so, yeah, we, we're going to aim for that. But very often, you know, there's that balance, isn't, isn't there, by providing people with real good value for money. Not overwriting it, um, because if people want to back a uh, a bigger product, then they, they, they will do. Um, and there'll be a bigger Kickstarter coming along. And sometimes sometimes the the joy, I always remember reading, uh, getting Gossy Dragon magazine back in the day. And sometimes the joy of Dragon magazine was the, you, you just get a glimpse of some of the stuff that developers were coming out with and a glimpse of new bits of lore or um, monsters or rules or items or whatever. And then there'd be a later book that would go into in, you know, do a real bigger deep dive. And sometimes in the books, we, there are glimpses of things and then there can be a deep dive in the zine. And uh, you see how they just they just hopefully when they, if we, we're going to complement each other quite nicely like that, you know. And with that, with that in mind, what do you? Sh I do want to congr congratulate you on at the very least 
technically getting three times over your initial goal. Yeah. But <laughs> um, even even with the bad luck that happened, because Murphy's Law is still a thing. Yeah. Um, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the zine? Um, well, I we're going to um, have it together. Um, I'm writing it at the moment. We're going to have it together by September. Uh, so where our, what we've, our, our fulfillment date is. And then we're going to probably... Um, it's probably going to be ready as a downloadable product on something like, you know, our drive through store um, closer to Christmas. Um, Cause it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a slap in the face to the, to your backers, isn't it? If you um, launch it as a retail product within days of filling it to them, you know, because people don't like that. So we're going to, we're going to sort of have a, a, a phased release like that so um uh you should be able to get your first edition in on if you've not backed already which you can do by the way and you know i um, would, would urge that uh, there's only still about four or five days to go um you can get your first edition uh probably around christmas time mm -hmm. <laughs> i i need the time <laughs> The time of the year where everybody from the UK looks at the weather in my neck of the woods and goes, "How do you stand that?" Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and I, yeah, I, and I, you know, uh, I, I, I am one of those people. I really am. Um, then again, it, it's it, it must be nice to have seasons, though. It, you know, we we just have permagray, which uh, 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 meteorologists haven't worked out what that is anymore. Is it? But we have like permagray. It's neither hot nor cold. It's just endless nothing. Well, not everybody in the states has weather as crazy as mine. Um, no. Like over in over in Cat, I've got a friend over in Cali where the weather is always. Se <laughs> Anytime I'm asking the weather, it's always seventies and sunny. <laughs> It's like there you that's, go. got, that's got to be the easy. That's got to be the easiest meteorologist job ever. Yeah, yeah, that well, sounds fantastic. Oh. Um, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think it's going to be um, a, a pretty great little product. The um, the um, uh, the Artlander, and we do do. If you anyone wants to check it out, we do do a kind of like a free edition on um, um, on drive through. Which is a, a, a much shorter, sort of just a ten pager, but full of you know fun, fun little kind of forays into the art verse with a, and I do um, a creator of the month because I like to ch just chat with interesting people and find out what they're doing and what they're creating and what they're working on. Uh, and there are an awful lot of those in this field, so we, we we do that. So find us on the drive through, and you can. We do one arc, one mini arc lander a month. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I'll cer I'll certainly be keeping an eye on on that sort of thing, as I, cool. as I always do because I'm watching everything. <laughs> but with all of that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way back to the temple and enjoy the madness at play here. It's okay. It's 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 always great fun to chat. You know, I mean, I think this is my third time now, and what I what I enjoy is, you know, obviously talking about RPGs and talking about the kind of the culture that surrounds them and and sort of why we're doing what we're doing. But it's always uh, really really interesting, great chat that we do here. I really really like. Her. Yeah. Yeah. And. Of course, any time you see fit to return, the door is always open. Wow, As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Fantastic. Cool. Well, thanks so much. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>